Hi there, I'm sitting here on the floor next to my ham radio cart. Right here, this is my set of Drake Twins that dates from the 1970s. Uh, so this is going to be a sort of a hybrid of a video. It's both a ham radio project and it's a Raspberry Pi project. So these particular radios, they would generally be tuned with this control here. This is a permeability tuned oscillator. It's an entirely analog system. It uh, has a system of gears and a worm gear and it moves uh, like the core of an inductor in and out. I really don't understand all of the uh, analogs ins and outs, but this here makes a, a very sensitive oscillator. And the problem you will have with this dial here is that this oscillator, being it was uh, analog and somewhat mechanical, there's actually gears and stuff in there, it does tend to fluctuate a little bit. You know, if the temperature in your room is fluctuating, you know, maybe these gears move a little bit. And this thing can wander like about 20 to 50 hertz or so, which can be kind of a pain to deal with. And you'll be constantly fidgeting the dial to keep it on target. So what I did is I took a Raspberry Pi, I put it in this box up on top here, where you're seeing the readout, and that Raspberry Pi drives an AD9851 uh, digital synthesizer, which will synthesize the frequency instead of using this dial. So instead of using this analog system to set the frequency, we'll use this digital. And we actually have up here, let me bring this down to where you can see it, kind of a controller right here, and you can see I can turn this jog dial on my controller. This is actually an optical encoder, so it's a 128 pulse per revolution optical encoder. And turning that, let me make sure you can see the dial, you know, you can see I'm able to change the frequency. I can even do it uh, in a very fine steps, I can change bands. I can do um, you know all kinds of things from this. I've got uh, memories programmed into it. So uh, I'm going to go into a little bit of detail on this project. This was kind of fun, doing a combination Raspberry Pi and uh, ham radio project. Now to avoid confusion, I did want to mention that I've done a couple of very similar projects. So if you were watching my previous ham radio video, you would have seen this blue display on top of the ham radio, and this was simply a frequency counter. So if I can poke around in here and look at the insides, this was a, an eBay eight digit blue frequency counter. Um, you can forget this board, it's not used. This other board is just a, uh, a filter. Um, and then over here we just had the injection line hooked up to the frequency counter. So this was just a straight sort of eBay frequency counter project here. Um, and it displayed the frequency on the analog dial. So if I move the analog dial around, the frequency on the frequency counter would change. Let me try to get it back where it was. And uh, this, doing one of these is very helpful um, because often you're trying to match up an exact frequency. I mean, you know it's supposed to be on the border there at like 7204. Um, and being able to read it out with digital is nice. Um, because the analog display is not too precise. So you can build yourselves one of these very easy on uh, from, from this one eBay part here, this frequency counter module. Like I say, the rest of this is just wired straight through to the injection and this one here is just some filtering on the power supply where it comes in. You could build one of those cheap and easy. Uh, you hook it up to your injection port on your Drake. You put in a T adapter if you're using the transceiver. Um, you hook a good high quality um, low capacitance coax to it and you'll have yourself a digital readout. So that's what I had the previous video. And this video we will be talking about this which is instead um, the digital synthesizer. So this isn't just a counter, this actually produces the frequency itself. Okay, so let's see how we're going to make this work. So my radio has two pieces. It has a transmitter and a receiver, the T4XC and the R4C. It's also a power supply. Uh, for the purposes of this video, we can ignore the power supply. Uh, but to synchronize these two together, there is this cable here called injection this one right here and this sends a signal from the receiver to the transmitter that tells the transmitter what frequency the receiver is on you can also switch it to do the opposite direction and the transmitter will tell the receiver what frequency to use or you can separate the two and you can tune them independently so in order to do this without having to modify the radio in any way it seems like the easiest place 
is to send our desired frequency on this injection line and then we will convince both the receiver and the transmitter not to use their internal oscillators and just to use this one so we will take and we will put our uh, DDS BFO and we will put a T adapter here like so and then you go into this uh, receiver and you select unused crystal by selecting an unused crystal uh, the receivers uh, local oscillator will not oscillate and it will instead pay attention to what is showing up on this injection line and then we put the transmitter in RCVR mode uh, which tells the transmitter to go ahead and listen to this line and at this point we've got both pieces of equipment listening to that uh, DDS VFO. However, this when I originally tried this I thought this was going to work it didn't work out so great and the problem was that this signal that I would send out on the DDS VFO it would actually get um, pretty badly attenuated by by the receiver so there's a bunch of um, coupling capacitors in this thing that based on the position of the pre-selector knob couples this injection signal into the rest of the receiver if you don't have that thing perfect it messes up and attenuates this line this line gets all funky into the transmitter the transmitter puts out poor power because it's getting a poor frequency signal seems like that could be bad on the transmitter I really didn't like um, I didn't like that approach where where these two pieces of equipment were so interdependent on one another and would would glitch this signal if, if they weren't perfectly tuned so I modified this a little bit um, so what I did is I simply cut the injection line and I put my DDS VFO and I put two signals output one going to each one of those so what I did is I put a separate buffer in here one buffer sending a signal to the receiver one buffer sending a signal to the transmitter and doing that um, even if this thing attenuates the signal it's not going to affect the signal going to the transmitter we always get a clean signal going to the transmitter again you're going to select unused crystal to disable the local oscillator there and over here you're going to put this in RCVR mode to make it pay attention to that injection signal um, so that just meant using two cables instead of one it meant getting rid of the T in there it seemed like a cleaner implementation now let's talk about uh, the schematic for the signal generator itself okay so we will see this is really pretty straightforward straightforward with a lot of connectors and things thrown on for extra purposes but up here we have our Raspberry Pi I ended up using a Pi Zero W because it's small low power etc and it has the built-in Wi-Fi now people are going to think I'm crazy for taking a, a general purpose Linux computer with Wi-Fi and all of that unpredictable behavior and sticking it in a box on top of my um, ham radio receiver and then hooking it up to the uh, the local injection cable I mean you would think you would just get all kinds of birdies and noise and interference and who knows what all from this but it really doesn't seem that bad and when you when you watch the demo in a few minutes uh, you'll see that it, it seems to work pretty good maybe a few birdies I have yet to analyze that but but so far not so bad um, so anyway you've got the Raspberry Pi um, just because I wasn't sure how well that was going to work out I also put a footprint on the board for an Atmega 328 happens to be my favorite Atmega these days so one or the other don't do both um, this would be if you didn't want all of this unpredictable behavior that comes from a general purpose Linux machine use a microcontroller also put on a place to put a crystal in there for that that could be a, a temperature compensated crystal oscillator uh, if you wanted to do actual frequency measurements with the Atmega something like that maybe haven't really thought that through yet haven't needed to go there uh, then over here we have the DDS uh, section 
Um, so the key thing is this module that you can get on eBay, and I will put up a picture of it here. I think it's at AD 9850 or 9851 or something like that. Comes on a little dual inline module, um, and it plugs in. And to control it, you've got four uh, lines here, which are your clock, load, data, and reset. Um, so if I remember right, you clock a bunch of data bits in, and then you, you tick the load line, and that will load oh, like 32 bits or something in. I've, I've got code that programs this um, in my GitHub repo. Uh, the reset, I don't think I use the reset line, don't need to reset it. But every time you want to change it, you just uh, send your digital stuff out on there. You can bit bang that from Python, no problem. Out of the other side of it, it comes out here, this DDS out. That is your digitally synthesized frequency. So this thing can do, oh, I don't know, up to 35 megahertz, I think, maybe 50 megahertz. Um, whatever you program it to do, it's going to put the frequency out on that line. So what we need to do then is we need to take that frequency and send it out through a buffer to drive our transmitter and receiver. Um, now, I happen to get this schematic here from a guy named K3JLS. I went to his website. He sells... Um, DDS VFO units for the Drake TR7 and similar uh, receivers. I think they're like already built, ready to go. Um, or he sells boards or kits. Or I see he has nice stuff on eBay. And he has a nice website that explains his approach to this as well. Um, so I kind of borrowed some of this uh, from his schematic. Um, he used a post filter in his, this um, Butterworth filter here. Um, his is designed, because it's designed to use with a Drake TR7, he put a filter that limits um, the frequency output down to 7 megahertz. That doesn't work for the Drake Twins because that injection line we've got actually goes all the way up to about 35 megahertz. So what goes on that line is actually 5645 plus the signal. Um, to the Drake. So, it, you know, if you're doing a 7 megahertz, um, like 7.074 is where I like to work. 56.45 plus 7.074, you're at 12 megahertz, 0.719. Um, this filter that went with the uh, K3 uh, JLS uh, project would not work there. If you go to 10 meter, then you're at around 30 megahertz plus 56.45, now you're up to 35.645 megahertz, um, well outside the range of his filter. Um, so that's why I mark this as optional. Uh, for me, when I, when I built this, I just took and I wired, I think I wired from there, just ran a wire down to there, just bypassed the whole thing. There are filter calculators on the web. So I've been thinking about plugging in the parameters of my filter, what I want. You know, I want a 35 megahertz Butterworth filter and then coming up with these inductor capacitors. It'll spit, spit all that out. That's going to be like the next phase of my project will be to design this filter um, using the calculators online and come up with, uh, you know, a 35 megahertz uh, filter. I don't know if that's going to do much good because it's a pretty wide filter, um, but we'll see. Uh, anyway, for now, in this, for this video, I just wired across that section. Uh, then coming out of there, we have a potentiometer that sets the level, and then we have this two-transistor um, buffer, and this is used to, you know, give you a good clean output signal that can be hooked up to your transmitter or receiver. Now, I tried to track down the origins of this circuit, K3JLS, he certainly uses it, but I found reference to this very similar same circuit in half a dozen other places. And I might have tracked it down to someone named N3ZI. I found his web page where he talks about it a little bit. He does talk about maybe changing up these values a little bit, maybe adding a capacitor there. Um, so this circuit is kind of, it kind of floats around the web. Uh, these two transistors are, I see they're not marked on here, they're 2N2222. Um, two of those transistors um, you know, this, these components, they're probably chosen for that 7 megahertz bandwidth. Um, I'm not particularly an analog guy, so I have not gone and I have not optimized these components to give you up to 35 megahertz of bandwidth. Uh, that is something that probably should be done. 
um, make sure that this uh, two transistor amplifier supports the full range that we need for the Drake twins. Uh, so anyway, you go through the potentiometer set the level, you go through the two transistor amplifier, and you go out in SMA connector. And this here goes to receiver. And then down here I duplicated the exact same circuit. So potentiometer, two transistor buffer, SMA, and this one goes to XMTR. Um, I should mention there's also some filtering. I duplicated the filtering, so there's a 100 microhenry inductor resistor and a couple of uh, filtering capacitors. You want a nice clean signal going to the transistor amplifier because you don't want artifacts um, in this board making their way out into the RF. Um, now, the way I have hooked this up, um, these two pots will interact with one another um, a little bit. Uh, I have them tuned so we get about two and a half volts out peak to peak out of each one of these. Um, something in the two and a half to four volt range somewhere. It, it varies a little bit on what frequency you're at. But um, I've noticed these two will interact. I don't know if I should have added a decoupling capacitor in there. Um, again, I'm more of a digital person than an analog one. Um, Another thing that you could consider doing is um, if you had the board space, um, you could actually have two um, DDS uh, synthesizers, one for driving the transmitter and one for driving the receiver. Um, the advantage to that would be that you could run them at different frequencies. Uh, you can actually do it at different frequencies with a single one. And what you do then, if you want to run them different frequencies with a single one, you would look at the mute line coming from the receiver. Um, or coming from the transmitter, I should say. So the mute line on the transmitter, whenever it goes to transmit, it grounds that mute line. You could use that as a signal to say, oh, hey, I'm transmitting, change the frequency uh, to the frequency I want to transmit on versus the frequency I want to receive on. Be a cheap way to get uh, two different frequencies out of the same DDS module. Have not done that yet. I'm never the case that I transmit on a different frequency. Anyway, I hope that makes some sense here. Like I say, I wish I knew a little bit more about these um, component selections, about the analog stuff in this um, two transistor amplifier um, that I could explain it a little better. Again, I'm, that's not my strong point in electronics. I can tell you that there is another project out there that uses an alternative using an MMIC. And I think that was a MAR-8. Um, and MMIC being a specific RF amplifier IC. I have not really evaluated that. I did get myself some MAR-8s. I might, I might try playing with it, around with it a little bit. But that would be an alternative to the whole two transistor thing. I think you'd use a single MAR-8 along with decoupling capacitor and a DC injection um, to power it. Um, so that, that gives you an idea of what's going on down there. Up here, um, I have some, the power comes in via barrel jack or a two pin header. We go through a 100 micro Henry inductor into some capacitors. I'd like to put lots of filtering on because lots of junk comes in on that power line, particularly when my uh, transmitter is active. We can go through up to two voltage regulators. Certainly you need the 7805 to get your five volt for the Raspberry Pi. Uh, but uh, I considered also I could stick a 7812 in front of it if I run it, wanted to run off of some other voltage. Turns out I end up uh, running this off of 12 volt anyway, so I just wire straight across that particular regulator. I just put my 12 volt in there, it gets kicked down to 5, 5 volt goes into the Pi. Now, the DDS module, you can power it off of either um, the Raspberry Pi, because the Raspberry Pi will have 3.3 volts coming out, or you can use a separate supply. Uh, the first time I built up this circuit, I powered this off the Raspberry Pi, and what I found was if I SSH into the Raspberry Pi and I start, start executing commands, I would hear little ticks in the output of the receiver. It, you know, it'd go tick, 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 you know, as it's running things. And that is because, you know, this Raspberry Pi was um, drawing power on that 3.3 volt internal regulator. 
which was causing power fluctuations to go into here, causing power fluctuations in here, and the power fluctuations making their way all the way out. So I respun my original circuit, and I added a separate 3.3 volt regulated. Um, again, uh, I put it behind another 100 micro Henry um, inductor and uh, several different filter capacitors. I used a surface mount 3.3 um, volt regulator because that tends to be what I have laying around. And it comes down here to this three way or two way solder jumper, and you can select to power this either the Pi or the separate 3.3 volt regulator. Highly recommended uh, that you power it from the separate regulator. Now we have to in, um, add some controls to this. So you'll see I've got several different headers here. I've got two I squared C headers, uh, SCL, SDA, um, hooked up to the Raspberry Pi. And I've got two um, SPI headers, MOSI, MISO, SCK, um, etc. Uh, I think CS uh, hooked up to the Raspberry Pi. That will allow you to add a variety of parts such as, you know, um, I squared C display devices or SPI display devices or keypads or, or whatnot. You, you can kind of hook up what you want um, to those four headers. They're just general purpose headers. There's also a header right here uh, for a keypad where I just took a bunch of GPIO lines and I broke them out so that you can wire them up to the keys. You know, some power comes out on all of these headers if you want to power anything. And then there is the header for an encoder. And I used, uh, gosh, I don't remember if it was a Bosch or a Borns encoder, but I used a 128 pulse per revolution optical encoder. I found these on eBay. Um, I got a really good deal on them. I used them uh, back when I did my um, Etch-a-Sketch using uh, e-paper display project. Same encoders left over from that project. Um, you want an encoder that has a lot of pulses per revolution because you want, you want a lot of precision in your frequency dial. You don't want something with like 8 or 16 pulses per revolution. You want 64 or 128 or 256 or something like that. And you can get that with an optical encoder. They're, they're basically, you know, they're LEDs and, and photo transistors inside of it with a little wheel in there and the wheel will have notches in it and the lights shine through the notches. Some, something like that's going on inside of it. Um, that'll give you two different uh, pulses that come out of that. Um, I ran my encoder off of 5 volt. So to use it on the Pi, I did throw in a couple uh, dropping resistors, a couple 150 ohm. Actually, um, incorrect. I ended up using 1k uh, dropping resistors on those two lines. Uh, but this is, you know, you're going to have to, if you want to build one of these, you're going to have to find yourself a cost-effective um, high-resolution encoder uh, on eBay or Mauser or DigiKey or someplace. Um, you know, you don't want to spend hundreds of dollars on one. You want like 10 bucks on one. Um, anyhow, let's take a look at what I uh, constructed now. Okay, let's take a quick look at the implementation. So I'll unplug my Raspberry Pi. Uh, you can see down underneath the Raspberry Pi, there's really nothing there. There's a footprint for an Atmega and a footprint for a crystal if I wanted to use it. I did not. I used the Raspberry Pi. Plugs in upside down. It's just a Pi Zero W. It's actually the original Pi Zero W. I think I've, I haven't used the new um, Zero Two Ws yet. So it just kind of sits here upside down. You want to make sure to align it up properly. Don't be off by a pin. Uh, plugs in there. Over here is the uh, DDS module that does the uh, frequency synthesis. Over here we've got the buffer amplifiers, two of them, each with an individual potentiometer. One of them for the transmitter, one of them for the receiver. Uh, what else is in here? Up here is the uh, regulator for the 5 volt. And then down here is a little surface mount regulator for the 3.3 volt. There's actually a header underneath the DDS module. There's this little uh, solder jumper where you can select between powering the DDS off of the Raspberry Pi or powering it off of this separate little regulator that I happen to have. I recommend using the separate regulator. 
And that's really all there is to it. There's a bunch of connectors on here for connecting uh, I squared C peripherals, for connecting the encoder, for connecting the keypad. Um, over here on this side, I have this other little board that I happen to have, which is a multi-stage uh, filter. And it's got some inductors and capacitors. I don't know if it really does any good. Um, my NFED half-wave antenna, it tends to create a lot of um, RF that, that sort of gets into stuff, so I have to put a big RF choke on the power wire. So I started experimenting with this to see if I could do away with having to use the, the big external RF choke. I really haven't had time to evaluate it, but it's just inductor, capacitor, inductor, capacitor, then hops over here into the other board. And then on the front, we have these alphanumeric display boards. Um, Adafruit actually makes these um, with these alphanumeric displays. This is actually my respin of the Adafruit board. I added some, some pins on the side so that I can easily daisy chain one module to the next. Um, I don't know why Adafruit didn't do that. It seemed like really obvious that, that uh, you'd want to do that, that you'd want to chain multiple modules together like this. So anyway, I respun that board. Um, and this just hooks up via I squared C and drives the displays. Out the back comes a cable which has the keypad wires as well as um, a couple of wires that go to the optical encoder. So over here on the keypad, and pay no attention to the, the legends on the buttons, these just happen to be uh, spare buttons that I had. Um, these are just regular old uh, Cherry MX Blue uh, key switches, uh, nothing but the best. And uh, this, uh, this optical encoder over here is kind of a fancy um, 128 pulse per revolution optical encoder that I got off eBay. I got it uh, cheap. To buy one of these new is like hundreds of dollars, I guess. Um, I got it like 10 bucks or something. Um, I'm sure you can find other um, optical encoders. You just want something with a lot of pulses per revolution, not eight or 16 like the cheap mechanical encoders, but find yourself a optical encoder with the 64 or 128 or 256 or something like that. There should be plenty of surplus ones out there. Optical encoders, just a little, little box down here. We've got a header plugs into it. And then you can see over here is my keypad where I've got some wires going to the keypad. Um, nothing, nothing tremendously complicated about this particular build. I do think uh, that I will revise this and I will put this in a single combined case that can sit on top of the receiver. So what I would do is probably have the digital readouts, then I'll put the dial over here to the right of it, and then maybe the buttons underneath the digital readouts. Um, I was thinking the hand controller would be nice, but it's got a cable anyway, so it, it seems like it would be better just to build it all into one. So I may do that next. Um, anyway, that is it for the hardware. Okay, let's go ahead and do a quick demo. First, I'm going to turn on the software. Let me turn it on and run. There it goes. It did a quick banner, and it should automatically switch to its first preset frequency. Let's turn this down a little bit. Okay, so it automatically starts out at my initial preset, which in this case is 7.074 megahertz. That is FT8. That's where I do a lot of the, uh, the digital stuff that I've been doing lately. Right now, there's not a lot going on at uh, FT8 um, on uh, 40 meter. Uh, it's the middle of the day. Uh, 20 meter will probably be le more active. So let me switch over there. You've still got to change your band switch and your pre-selector. We press the band button, now we're on 20 meter. And you can see right there we're on 20 meter uh, FT8. And that's what FT8 digital signals sound like. Not, not super interesting to listen to digital signals. Um, so let's go back and we'll play around on 40 and listen to some voice stuff. So again, switching my band switch, my pre-selector, and then I hit this. Uh, starting back at my preset for 7.074. Um, switch this back over to lower side band for voice. Um, and then we're going to, uh, one of these buttons is to cycle through memory. So if I push this, it'll go through my memories. Oh, yes. go here in Carmichael. Houston, in the Carmichael, California. 
This is uh, 7240. Uh, they're currently doing uh, like a, a buy and sell equipment thing going on. Uh, this is, I'll often CQ around 7239, 7240, but on Sundays they're doing this thing. So you can see here we've got good sound. Um, again, you can go up or down easily with the jog dial. If you push this button, it'll change the step. I was doing 10 hertz steps. We can go 100 hertz, and we can really jog fast. I'm back to 10 hertz steps. And uh, I've also got another memory in here programmed, which is the noontime net. And that's um, that's the noontime net. They do that every day around noon. Um, let's play with the jog dial a little bit while we're here. So there's something down here at 7204, but I can't I can't hear it real well. I was hoping we could find some CW out here, but I'm not hearing anything. There are a few of these uh, birdies going on. Not very many of them, but occasionally. Okay, this being a Raspberry Pi, a general purpose Linux computer, I can and did develop a web app for it. So this is just a very simple web app, just a straightforward thing. I pulled a JavaScript uh, knob implementation off the web. I think it's using uh, Yahoo controls of some sort. And the same thing is displayed on the web UI as is displayed on the hardware. So if I take this and jog it up, we can see that as I move this, that moves in real time. To move it forwards, we can move it backwards. There we go. And we can also take in, we can 7074000, we can set a value. There we go. And, uh, you know, if I feel like it, I will beef up this web implementation. I'll put buttons so I can directly change the memories, um, buttons so that I can change the band from it. You know, why not build in all of the same capabilities that you can get from the, from the, the hardware I've developed. Okay, in conclusion, uh, how did this project work out? Um, how, has it been successful? Well, I think it's been successful. I actually have it operating right now, making FT8 connections on 7.074 megahertz, the 40 meter band. I think it is making an 
active contact right now while we speak. I've actually, since I installed it, I've made hundreds of FT8 uh, contacts using it. Um, and I've also made a few uh, voice contacts. So I made uh, a voice contact just earlier today, a guy in an adjacent state on uh, 40 meter. He said I sounded great uh, when I was talking to him. So the nice thing about it is you dial it to a frequency and it stays there. If you do that with the Drake dial, um, being analog and somewhat old and finicky, first of all, it's hard to get it exactly on frequency with the Drake. And then even once you get it there, you, you tend to be every 10 minutes, you're over there reaching, uh, nudging it back and forth a little bit to try to keep it on frequency just because it is a mechanical um, analog uh, mechanism. Um, but the digital, um, it takes that kind of concern away. You know, you can have memories, um, you can jog it at different speeds. Sometimes, you know, the analog dial takes you a long time of jogging that thing through to get where you want. Uh, the digital is a lot nicer in that respect. Um, but it also takes away a little bit of the character of the radio. You know, if, if you want a modern digital ham radio, you can buy a modern digital ham radio. There's a million of those. Nice thing about these is that they are old tube radios. They kind of have their own unique uh, character to them and their own uh, fun in running them. And, you know, having to nudge the dial back and forth constantly can actually be... Uh, part of the experience, you know, uh, but I do like these projects that are kind of taking a hybrid of new and old uh, Technology and putting them together. So I'm enjoying it I'm probably going to keep developing uh, this a little bit over the, the coming months and see where I can get with it Thank you for watching my video. Please visit my website at www.smbaker.com for more electronics projects and sand rail stuff. Bye